So what we're going to talk about today is a framework, uh, as Christoph said from my book, Seeing Around the Corners, uh, which really looks at the question of strategic inflection points. So what this presentation will cover is kind of what is a strategic inflection point, uh, how should we be thinking about them, and then a framework I've just developed, which is specifically relevant to our current COVID-19 um, uh, situation. Uh, my expectation is I'll talk maybe for 25 minutes, but if there are questions that come up, please uh, do put them in, and I don't mind stopping for them if if people would, would like to speak kind of in the moment. That's fine with me. Uh, so please, if, if there's a good question that comes up, please feel free to um, interject. So let's talk about inflection points. And um, this concept was really made very popular by Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel. And he wrote a book called Only the Paranoid Survive back in the 90s. And what he was looking at was the inflection point facing Intel as it made the wrenching decision to change its business model from basically selling memory chips to selling um, microprocessors. And you know, he said, it's a time when there's a 10X change in something that you thought was true about your business. And the reality of inflection points is if you get them right, they can take your business to new heights. But if you get them wrong, your business can go into a decline. And so I thought what I'd discuss today is kind of what is in one, how do you recognize one? Um, and so, as he said, an inflection point is something that creates a 10x change in the assumptions underlying your business. Now, the reason I think that's such an interesting definition is that any business, you know, no matter what you do, is born at a particular point in history. And some things are possible and other things are not. And as a consequence, you develop a recipe for success that's based on those constraints. And so uh, to take a simple example, if you look at conventional retailing, uh, retail, a person to person retail was always about how much real estate you had. So what was your square footage? Right. And that was the limitation, because how much you sold back before the Internet was dependent on how your store operated. So all your metrics, the way you looked at the world was all about um, sales per square meter and inventory turns and um, how well your store did to other stores or stores in the other parts of the world. Um, so that was all the constraints that traditional retail lived under. And every single metric, every KPI, every reward system, every way you ran your business was tuned around those constraints. Now, once those constraints change, and the, obviously the advent of the internet and e-commerce has dramatically changed the landscape for retail, now you need different metrics. You need a different way of looking at the world. And it makes the old way of looking at the world you know, no longer applicable to the current situation. And what happens is, gradually, your understanding of the world and the way the world's really operating start to diverge. And when the divergence gets big enough, your business can actually be put under tremendous uh, pressure. So to take another example, um, let's take something like YouTube, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> when YouTube first started, nobody took it seriously. I mean, you didn't have corporate leaders quaking in their boots because, oh my God, this was going to disrupt the advertising business, the media business, the television business. No, I mean, when YouTube first started, nobody really thought anything of it because what was it? It was cat videos, right? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't serious business content. Um, well, today, you know, the idea that you could actually make a video and get it into the hands of millions, even billions of people, uh, almost for free um, and instantly. I mean, what a radical idea, and yet that's true. So 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you wanted to make a video and get it into millions of people's hands, you had to be a media empire. I mean, you had to sell, you know, be sending like reels of videotape around the world. And today, literally two people in their garage with a reasonably priced smartphone can um, you know overcome uh, do what these media empires used to do before? So that's an inflection point. It changes something very fundamental about the way we understand business uh, to work. And of course, today we're all in the midst of probably the greatest inflection point any of us will experience, certainly in our business lives, with the advent of the pandemic and the 
you know, varying responses of countries all over the world to how we're going to navigate uh, through that. So the first question to ask is, what is the information that we look to when we're trying to figure out what to do in the midst of a very uncertain situation? So the first observation I would make is that when you think about the data, the indicators that you use, there's always three kinds of data. There's lagging indicators where, you know, it's good information, but it doesn't really tell you anything about the future. And most of the information that we use in business is of the lagging variety. So all your financial reports, last year's, you know, numbers, your, uh, you know, your sales, all those kinds of things are lagging indicators. So they're great, but they don't tell you anything about the future. So an example of this was, uh, I remember an analyst congratulated Jeff Bezos of Amazon for having had a great quarter. And Bezos lashed out at the guy. He said, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. The quarter I, I just had, the quarter Amazon just had, is the result of decisions I made four years ago. Congratulating me on a great quarter is just an idiotic thing to say. So I thought that was an interesting perspective on, on lagging indicators. Then you have current indicators. Now, current indicators are useful because they tell you where you are. They're a bit like the speedometer in your car telling you how fast you're going. So in business, current indicators might be things like employee engagement, um, net promoter scores, how loyal are your customers, how often do they come back. It, it tells you something about how things are right now. And it's very useful to have those, of course, it's like a dashboard. But the hardest thing to get and the trickiest to take into account when you're making plans for the future are leading indicators. Now, leading indicators, by definition, are not facts yet. They haven't made that progress. They're often qualitative. They are often something reasonable people can disagree on. You know, you could see the same data and draw different conclusions about what's going to happen. Uh, and the most important thing to remember about a leading indicator is that a measure of its quality is not, was it a prediction that came true, but rather, was it a plausible enough story about the future that we took reasonable action in a reasonable amount of time? So a great illustration of this is, um, you know, back in the mid 90s, a bunch of computer programmers from all over the world said, oh, my God to save on what was expensive storage space at the time, programmers all over the world programmed the year in major computer systems as two digits. And come the millennium, come the turn of the millennium, um, you know, computer systems all over the world was, were going to think it was 1900, right? And this was gonna be dire people. We're going to have, you know, airplanes drop out of the sky and nuclear plants are going to become unstable and, and we should all move to Montana and stockpile wheat. I mean, that was the sort of survivalist uh, dire warning. So the big moment comes, year 2000, what happens? Nothing happened. Why did nothing happen? Enough people took the early warning seriously that they made the investment to avert disaster. And you could make the argument right now that there were plenty of early warnings about the current pandemic, but it wasn't taken seriously. enough. People ignored the um, people that said this is coming. You know, it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when, and we should be preparing now. And that warning went uh, unheeded. But that's the nature of an early warning. So obviously, if you're trying to think about the future and you're trying to develop an early warning system, it's the leading indicators that are the most important and yet the most difficult for most human beings to um, process. So I'll try to give you some ways of thinking about that you might find uh, instructive. So the first thing to think about is when you're thinking about leading indicators, the strength of a signal that something is likely to change begins you know, very weakly. It's a weak signal, right? In the early, early stages, the predictive power is very low. It's hard to tell the signal from the noise. You don't know which of these, I mean, you could, there are hundreds of things that could be important in the environment. It's hard to tell which ones really are. And then that warning, you know, gathers strength over time until you get to what I call time zero. So time zero is a, a point in time at which this has arrived it's now here, we can take photographs, we can see oh, what's going on. You have facts. Now the difficulty with trying to make strategic decisions at time zero is that by the time you have facts, it's almost impossible to do something about them because your degrees of strategic freedom 
are inversely related to the strength of the signal that you have to operate with. And this is one of the great dilemmas of strategy, right? By the time you know what the right answer is, uh, it's too late to do anything about it. So what you want to be thinking about is how do I move my decision and action framework back in time to what I call the period of optimal warning? So not too early. Now, this is really important because a lot of people read my work and they think, oh, I need to be taking action, you know, on voice recognition enabled holographic technology. No, no, not too early. Don't, don't do too early. But don't wait too late. I mean, that's the critical thing. So somehow you want to be back somewhere where you've got enough evidence. The signals are strong enough that you want to be able to take some sort of action. You just don't quite know yet what the what the right you know answer is, but you, you have enough data that you think it's prepared to move forward. So the critical thing is how do you identify what a time zero event might be and then what I encourage you to do is work backward. So work backward in saying, okay, if time zero is this possible future event, what has to be true before I reach time zero? Uh, what would need to be true? So if I think about the Y2K, you know, the, the year 2000 bug, right? Um, what would have to be true before I hit time zero? Uh, there was a pretty strong prediction that a lot of bad things would happen if we didn't kind of go fix this. So people worked back in time and said, you know, come 1999, we better have the following things corrected or else we're going to have a real problem when time zero hits. Okay, so the obvious question then is, well, how do I have the imagination to come up with time zero events? Because, you know, it's often not that nobody predicted these things. I mean, the advent of internet commerce was well and strongly written about in 1995. So it wasn't a mystery that it could happen. But what you want to think about is, how do I create some relevant time zero events for myself? So I'm going to pick the current situation and we'll, we'll use the framework to really map out what we might be looking at um, right now in terms of what we want to be preparing for in terms of possible futures. Uh, so the way that I do it is I pick two major uncertainties. And you can do this for as many uncertainties as you want, but two at a time is the way that I like to go about it. And then you assign different values to each. So you've got one dimension which has two different values, the other dimension which has two different values. Then what I'm going to ask you to do is to tell a story about each resulting future situation. Uh, so you're going to tell a little story about what the future world might look like. And then you're going to craft a headline. And your headline is going to be your time zero event. So I'm going to use um, for this particular two by two, the uncertainty number one is the dominance of the current maximizing shareholder value construct. Uh, it's particularly acute in the U.S., but there are many other countries that sort of have this idea that business exists primarily to reward shareholders, and there's a whole flow of decisions and considerations that follow from that, um, and particularly in the U.S., but, but you know, there are other parts of the world that are influenced by this as well, since the U.S. capital markets are very important to most businesses all over the world. It's still a, a kind of a very dominant theory. And so does that situation still prevail or not? Do we, do we have maximizing shareholder value or do we look at a more social, more balanced stakeholder model of capital? The second dimension is um, you know, a pretty obvious one, which is you know, what happens to the world's economy? Does it bounce back relatively quickly or are we in for a lingering, you know, shrinking GDP kind of bad economy situation for the foreseeable future? Uh, so those are the two uncertainties. And if I look at those, what we can now see is a two by two. So on the one hand, maximizing shareholder value versus I'll call it stakeholder capitalism. And on the other dim dimension, prolonged global slowdown or kind of an economy bounces back situation. So let's take each of these sections of the two by two uh, in turn. So starting with the one where we have um, a long, slow slog in economic terms, and we have maximizing shareholder value continuing as the dominant ideology, I'll call it. Um, and I think that situation's pretty grim. It's les miserables, right? You've got pervasiveness of poverty and inequality, profound in economic insecurity for a lot of people, uh, which in turn will lead to political instability. And you'll have a lot of conflict over resources, all kinds of resources, water, energy, you know, you name it. But in a world of scarcity, uh, you can you just know there are going to be resource conflicts. and 
you can make a speculation how violent or how difficult those will be to contain, but you can predict that that sort of thing is likely to happen. So I'm, I'm calling that scenario kind of les miserables. <laughs> you know, it's not, not a bright future for, for most of us. Um, where the economy bounces back, but we continue to have maximizing shareholder value. I think I call that just kind of rinse and repeat. It continues what we've been doing for the last 40 years or so. Um, we'll continue to have high inequality. The middle and lower classes will continue to struggle. Um, and you know, the, the, the question is, if we're dealing with an improving economy, can that model really hold? Um, I'm not so sure, by the way, that it can hold if we've got a real prolonged global slowdown. Okay, moving over to where we, we you know, shift our systems and our regulations to more of a stakeholder capitalism future, um, but we're facing a prolonged global slowdown. What I think we will face there is much more of a rise in other um, interest groups than pure capitalism saying, hey, you know, resources are scarce, but they need to be distributed more fairly. So I think what we can expect there is grassroots protest, safety net programs expanded, greater taxation or even appropriation of wealth, um, a larger government, that seems almost inevitable, um, and, and so forth. So kind of a, a, in the American terms, I would call it kind of the return of the Great Depression. And, you know, the Great Depression provoked an awful lot of experimentation in, in social structures and social safety nets and, and so forth. And then probably the most optimistic scenario in this particular formulation is you have stakeholder capitalism and you have a return of a stronger growth economy. And there I think you get back to post-war consensus on the distribution of societal wealth. Uh, I think you have gradual narrowing of inequality uh, and social goods such as healthcare, education, um, housing are made more affordable. So those are sort of four stories about possible uh, futures that we could be thinking about. And now the next step in the process is we write a headline for each of those futures. So the first case, right, the, the sort of most miserable case is uh, why economic inequality leads to collapse. So, you know, we continue to try to support systems that are uh, increasingly fragile. In the second scenario, so economy comes back, but we're still looking at maximizing shareholder value. A headline there might be extreme poverty returns to America. And, um, you know, that you the situation that the, many of the societal programs of the Great Depression uh, alleviated uh, have now been taken away. And so you have people living in really extreme uh, poverty. If you got stakeholder capitalism, but a prolonged global slowdown, I think there what you have is an echo of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's um, philosophy, which was we have a rendezvous with destiny. We're going to take the means of production away from the capitalists. It's not fair. You know, that societal uh, uh, wealth creating institutions are narrowly controlled by, um, by uh, just a few. And that's really tyranny. And uh, FDR was very interesting. He was, a, you know, he came from wealth. And yet he was uh, adamant that the greater prosperity, shared prosperity was an imperative. And that was part of what launched the New Deal in the U.S. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, that it, the desperation of the situation led to massive amounts of experimentation, not all of which worked, but um, it was a very interesting uh, foundation for uh, the social programs that now many people simply take uh, for granted. And then, you know, if we have more of a broad shared wealth and the economy bounces back, I think there what we have is kind of a return to the Great Society uh, version 2.0, where you've got a real sense of, you know, let's see about tackling some of these large social problems and we'll use government almost as a force uh, for good. So those are four possible futures. And the question you can ask yourself is, well, um, you know, is my strategy fit for purpose given those different conditions? Or do I have a strategy that would only favor one of these? Now, a couple of points I think are worth reinforcing. Um, the first one is there's a big difference between prediction and preference. So one of the things I found most interesting about the current pandemic is you, you get a bunch of futurists in a room and you say, tell me about the future. And overwhelmingly, it's all positive, right? Oh, you know, we're going to have greater equality and, you know, it's going to it's going to change social relations and we're going to have people, you know, much more worker friendly workplaces and everybody's going to work from home. And it's gonna, it's like this utopia they're describing. And yet, if you look at the economic data, we're in for a really long, hard slog. And I, I, I just I'm baffled by why so many smart people 
you can kind of say this is all going to be just wonderful when you know there's going to be a lot of pain for a lot of people in in store. We we know that, and so I think you know don't let your preferences color your guesses about what's likely to be happening. And I think it's 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 very human to want the best, you know. I mean, me personally, I think the most likely outcome that we're going to be facing, you know, over the longer haul is the the kind of rendezvous with destiny scenario. But, you know, I could be wrong. Um, it, 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 <laughs> predictions are very difficult uh, to make. So what you then do is you say, well, okay, so if we take that we take that one, the rendezvous with destiny scenario, and you work backward into a very short time frame. What you can now begin to articulate are some indicators. What would we be looking at? And I thought just to keep it relevant for our audience, I would say let, let's let's make it a very, very short um, planning scenario, uh, planning horizon. Um, now, normally I would do this over a two, three year working backward period. So I'd say take 12 months before, 18 months before, two years before. Um, but since we were in the moment of urgency, let's think about what we want to be looking at right now. So if you look at now, right, um, which is nine months before, and I've placed that uh, time zero event at January 2021. So now what, what can we see? We can see many influential people loudly critiquing the existing system. So you have people like Harvard's Rebecca Henderson, who just wrote a wonderful book called um, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. Um, and she basically makes the argument that capitalism is, is self-destructing. We've got capitalists talking about capitalist suicide. We've got uh, several really um, influential books writing about financialization. And of course, um, Thomas Piketty's work on income inequality. So there's a lot of influential people basically saying the existing system isn't working for the bulk of people. You're starting to see very visible action by labor and other st stakeholders. Um, you've got strikes at companies like Amazon and Instacart. Uh, you've got people being willing to uh, unionize. You've actually got uh, the first union in a tech company, a Kickstarter's employees uh, made a decision to unionize, much to the astonishment of company leaders. You know, tech kind of doesn't believe in unions, but yet they felt that they did not have a voice in management decisions. And you're starting to see now popular opinion on safety net programs beginning to shift. Um, programs on worker safety, public health. Um, people are now looking to government to solve some of these intransigent problems. They're recognizing that markets can't do it. So I'd say we're seeing that right now. Those are all those are all things that are sort of in the air right now. So six months before, what, what could we look at to see if that scenario is happening? I think you'll start to see things like lawsuits, which are currently pending, being settled that say gig workers are actually employees and need to be treated as such. You're starting to see coalitions develop around core platform ideas. Uh, and, you know, there's a consensus beginning to emerge and you need that, right? I mean, we've got a lot of ideas out there, but if you don't have a critical mass of people saying, OK, this is the one that we're going to put our backing behind, uh, it doesn't work. Um, I think you'll also have to look at what's going on with lobbyists. You know, are they going to continue to uh, exert this sort of shareholder first mindset, or are they kind of being stopped? Are they, is, is that slowing down six months before? Now, three months before, you know, you've got elections in the U.S., um, and the big <laughs> question on everybody's mind is, well, which which way is it going to go? We don't we don't know at this point. But if you were to think about that, that rendezvous with destiny scenario, uh, you'd have much um, you know, progressive slates take over. You might even have. Um, the houses, uh, the congressional houses in the U.S. shift to a democratic leadership. Uh, and you'll have specific legislation. So things like limiting buybacks, providing worker protections, making it more difficult to offshore production, making it more expensive to do things like pollute the environment. Um, that's what you could see three months before. And at time zero, what you'd see is the, the event, right, is new political players borrow a line from the FDR playbook. Um, and this is actually quoting from a very famous speech he gave, the Red Rendezvous with Destiny speech. And he said, nothing less than a new American revolution, a political and economic revolution against the power and privilege of the 1% and conservative politicians of the day. That was literally what he said, the 1%. Um, so that's just an illustration of the variables. Now, again, I'm not saying I'm right. And I'm not saying these are predictions because I don't believe in predictions. What I'm trying to say is these would be pieces of evidence you could look at for that particular future scenario. Now, you'd want to do this exercise for all of them, right? If you're constructing a strategy based on different, being relevant to these different future states. So you'd also want to do one for the Great Society. You'd want to do one for Le Miserable, right? What are, what are, what's the evidence that um, that could be the way we're going? Now, I really want to caution you 
to avoid just collecting evidence that supports your preferences. We would all love to do that. I would love this to be the scenario that came out if that's the best case we can do, but that doesn't mean it, it will be. And so I think it's super important not to let yourself just get swayed into collecting evidence that supports your preferences. We call that the confirmation bias. And it basically says, I've already made up my mind about what scenario I prefer, therefore all the data I'm gonna get is relevant to that scenario. Uh, don't do that because it can create enormous blind spots. So if we're really headed towards a Les Miserables scenario, you would want to be prepared for that you know, if you're preparing for business and looking at contingencies. Okay, a um, couple of concluding thoughts and then I'll be able to take it on open for questions. Um, the first thing I would observe is when I first started in the world of strategy, you know, strategy at the time was mostly preoccupied with industry analysis. So industries that existed, companies that had already been born, markets that already created, and the people doing innovation, right? We were sort of off in a corner somewhere studying new markets and new industries and new capabilities. And the hardcore strategy people at the time didn't really take it seriously. Well, I think that's changing. And I think what you're seeing now is that strategy and innovation are now moving together. So I think part of it's the, the fast moving nature of competitive advantage. Part of it, I think, is the fact that innovative companies have become so dominant in so much of the world's economy in such a short period of time. So strategy and innovation coming together. And increasingly, I don't think you can talk about either of those things without talking about digital. You know, what what is the effect of digital, which is really just adding information and connectivity to things. And I think those three things coming together have created a really new strategic framework for us all to be uh, thinking about. So I'll conclude with the following observations. Um, inflection points don't happen instantly. They usually take a while. So even the current pandemic, um, if you go back to the George Bush administration, they were talking about and preparing for future pandemics. And yet here we are kind of basically caught unprepared. Uh, past success, so the recipe for success that um, you know, you, you carry with you from the past is not a predictor of the future, and it can actually create uh, blind spots. Most of us, most of the time, work with lagging indicators, and what you want to be doing is thinking about leading indicators. Uh, the strength of a signal, uh, you know, the stronger the signal, the less you can do something about it. So you really want to get more comfortable with working with weak signals and indicators. It's not about prediction. It's about preparedness. I, I want you to be thinking about how do I prepare my organization for whatever the uh, future is, however that translates. And finally, you can systematically do this. This is not some sort of dark art that you have to have a crystal ball, um, but it requires discipline and it requires some time. So take some time to go and, and work through those uh, things. Okay, so thank you. Um, here's just a lot of information about how you can take this further. My email's right there, it's probably available. I'm on Twitter at RG McGrath. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on YouTube. Um, I do write a monthly newsletter and this, this year, given circumstances, each month I'll be trying to give you a different set of tools or frameworks um, that would be relevant to the future. And I've started something new in the pandemic, which is what I'm calling Friday Fireside Chats, where I invite people who I think have interesting things to say uh, to come and share a conversation with me. And um, you can find out about them at, uh, at my website, which is uh, scheduled for upcoming Friday Chats. They're free, you just have to register. Um, so join us if that's of interest. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rita. Now we can go back to the Q&A part again, Rita. Let's see if I can manage to go out of the, um, of the Q&A part of the slides. There we go. So we have gotten a lot of questions, actually. That's really good. Uh, and the first question is from, and uh, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it yet, from Nea Barman. Do you have example of organization using scenarios in good way, meaning what organization has been able to see the early warning signs during this time? Well, there's, there's loads of them. Um, if you look at um, certainly historically, you know, companies like Shell used scenario planning very much in their um, you know in their strategy and forecasting. Uh, companies like SAP. 
um, uh, in the US, uh, Nike, very interestingly, made a pivot towards direct to consumer, which is now proving to be very useful as they as the retail channels that they traditionally leaned on have uh, kind of imploded. So there are a lot of companies that are that are kind of really trying to really build this sort of flexible future orientation into their the way that they think about things. You know, one of the more interesting European examples is uh, Klockner, uh, which is a steel uh, distribution company, and they began a very serious effort of um, digitization maybe have, have you know five year, years ago, and having done so much investment in digital has actually prepared them to make some really interesting pivots in their business model as they're navigating through this crisis. Cool. And then we have a question from Anonymous. So not, uh, we don't have her name, but how leaders could motivate people to elaborate this framework in teams? Best way to get everyone on board to give ideas? Oh, I think everybody in the early warnings exercise, right? So, you know, brainstorm about what uncertainties, figure out how to pick your time zero events. You can put small teams on different time zero events. In fact, I found it to be incredibly energizing and motivating for people to be actually involved. I mean, you can do a, a really good, really solid workshop uh, around the early warnings framework in perhaps two, three hours. Um, and I've started to run them, these workshops, I, I run them myself sometimes for some of my clients. And uh, um, virtual actually works super well for this exercise because you can actually bring together people from all over the world and they can input their ideas. You can have a record of it. So unlike a physical class or, or, or conference room where, you know, the loudest voices often prevail and some of the best ideas never get heard. In a virtual setting, you can really get everybody to contribute. And I found them to be really energizing and inspiring. And so, um, you know, given current realities, I'm doing a lot more of them virtually than I am in person these days. Great. Um, up to the next question. In your book, Seeing Around Corners, you talk about collective curiosity. How can you create and leverage that in an organization? So I think a couple of things come into play. I think the first basic requirement is something my colleague Amy Edmondson calls psychological safety. And she has a wonderful book called The Fearless Organization. And uh, I was just with her the other day and she said, um, you know, that, that, that some principles there for creating psychologically safe spaces. Uh, the first one is recognizing that any one of us can have a valuable idea. So really reaching out to the people in the team and saying, you know, even if even if you're not hierarchically in the power of position, that doesn't mean you don't have something that ought to be important to the rest of the team. Um, secondly is asking questions. So, you know, being genuinely curious about what other people have to say and then listening to the answer and then responding in a way that um, um, shows interest. So creating that sense of anybody can make a contribution, anybody can be heard. And she talks about, as a leader, um, go on a treasure hunt for the genius of your team. I just think that is such a wonderful kind of encapsulation of that. So I think the first thing is psychological safety. And then the second thing is this sort of spirit of curiosity is develop a poll mechanism you know, make it clear and visible and, and evident to people that you really are interested in what they have to say. You would like to be, um, you would like them to contribute and make and make it clear what what they know. Um, so create safe, small fora for people to give, give forth their ideas. Last idea there is something that Adobe does, which I think is fascinating. Um, they have a pro process that they call the kickbox process. And at Adobe, um, a kickbox is a small red box. And um, inside is some instructions, some notebooks. Um, but the most important thing in the kickbox is a thousand dollar gift card. And if you want to run an experiment or you want to test something with a customer, uh, anybody in the company can request a kickbox and spend that thousand dollars to do a test. The only requirement is you have to report on what you learned into a sort of a general database that they, that they keep. And the reason I think that's such an interesting example is that it's non-hierarchical, right? It, um, it, it, it democratizes the process and it rewards curiosity. Great. Uh, and our next uh, question is from, and again, I'm sorry if I uh, don't uh, spell the name uh, correctly, but from Jonas. And is focusing on competition rather than almost ignoring them detrimental to seeing around corners? It is. Short answers, it is. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos very famously said, look, you know, I would be very happy 
for my competitors to focus on the competition. I'll just focus on the customer and we'll be fine. And, you know, I think, you know, even when I think about strategy, this very archaic notion that we have of competitive advantage as opposed to customer advantage. Well, again, back to my observation earlier, you know, traditional strategy premised an industry that existed, competitive dynamics that exist, um, you know, markets that are, uh, patterns that are well proven, it's all about what is, right? So if you're just com focusing on your competition, you're gonna be focused on what is. And instead, if you want to think about the future, you've gotta be thinking about what might be, what could be, what what's coming. Uh, so focusing on your existing competition, I'm not saying ignore them, obviously it's important to have your competitive radar out there, but at the same time, I think excessively focusing on the competition is not gonna be the window to the future. And next question up is from Kelly. Let's use the scenario that we have reached time zero. And as you have said, would may be too late already. What is your advice in overcoming the, the deficit? You know, if you're in an inflection point, and, and Grove's book actually was about being in an inflection point. My book's a little bit more tilted towards what do you do before that. Um, if you're in an inflection point, what you have to do is make sense. You have to figure out what's going on. And the reality of right now is we are all in what I call a very high uncertain uh, assumption to knowledge situation. It's very uncertain. And so we're all uncertain. I don't know. You don't know. None of us knows what's going to happen. It's it's everybody's in the same boat. So the winners are going to be those that have very rapid learning processes. So you have to learn as fast as possible, as much as you can, um, as quickly as possible. So right now, where I, where I think we are, is we're just taking in vast amounts of information. And I think that's appropriate. You know, that's what this webinar is an example. Um, because what we want to do is get enough data that we can start to see early patterns emerge. Um, and so what, what we want to be doing right now is trying to learn rapidly, rapid, rapid learning cycles and iterate around it. So then when information's become more clear, um, you can start to converge on a few sensible courses of action. So the way that I'd look at this is a practice I call discovery-driven planning. So it's really all about discovery, not about proving you were right. So how do we need to discover what, what the next step is going to be? That the next act is going to be great and our next question is from ingela is actually about something we got to discuss very very shortly before the webinar began but uh, what do you think will be the biggest change in how where when we work after the pandemic well that's a fascinating question and i think right now you see different points of view um, I mean, there's one extreme point of view, which says, oh, the office is over and we're never going to do that again. Um, and then the other point of view, which is, no, it's all going to snap back to the way it was. Um, I think the reality is likely to be somewhere in the middle. Um, see, the thing is, six months ago, had you proposed to corporations, to anybody, uh, that, that you know, they make this huge investment in infrastructure required that anybody who could work at home could work at home, right? They would have said, yeah, yeah, you know, that's a nice thing. We'll get to it maybe next year, but, 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 but. it wouldn't have been seen as a corporate imperative. Well, come mid-March, there wasn't a company on the planet who had, you know, people that are doing administrative or thought work uh, that wasn't scrambling to make sure everybody had laptops and connectivity and the right software and training. And I mean, that was like job one for the world's corporations. So they've made that investment now. So I think this is the interesting part, having made that investment, even when it's possible to go back to the old way, um, you've already now accommodated the new way. You know, you've made it possible for people to do that. So what I think is likely to happen is more of a blend. I mean, I think we will still see a need for some kind of communal spaces when, when working together is important. Um, but I think it's much more likely that there will be a greater acknowledgement that you can be productive and you know, effective working remotely. A more interesting question that goes along with that is what does that mean for cities? You know, what does that mean for dense places of employment? I mean, historical views of innovation are that density and, in, you know, random interactions are very critical to creativity, to productivity, to clustering, you know, the, the idea that creative work forms in clusters, so Silicon Valley, you have, um, you know, in New York, you've got uh, uh, the, the, the similar so, sort of entrepreneurial clusters, Silicon Alley, they call it. Um, and, and I, you know, if we're working remotely as default, 
um, you have to kind of wonder, well, there's a lot of people right now saying, you know, I can't afford to live here. The rent is too expensive. And if I'm doing my work, work remotely, does it really matter where I am? So I'll be kind of interested to see how our social patterns evolve. I, I don't think we're going to lose the need for cities and places to congregate. I do think we've now broadened the range of possibilities that companies are willing to entertain. At the extreme end, there are some companies that are kind of going, you know, this working from home thing is really good. Why do I need to spend $10 million a year on fancy real estate? You know, better give everybody a bonus to buy and upgrade their home office and be done with it. <laughs> you know, so I think the effects on commercial real estate are going to be pretty grim. Cool. Um, do you think at this point it is viable to have detailed plan strategy and how much planning should be done in organizations? Having clarity on your strategy is really valuable. And in a separate talk, I talk a lot about how there's a five-step process I'm encouraging people to use to clean up their portfolios and, and move forward. So just briefly, step one is really look at your portfolio and just make some decisions. I mean, we've had a long run of good times. And when you have a long run of good times, there's a lot of stuff that accumulates in your portfolio. Now, there's projects that got started and nobody's really had the courage to kill them. There's things that were once relevant that no longer are, but it's such a, an effort to sort of get rid of them that nobody does. So the first step is really go through your portfolio and think about what's there. The second step is revisit your strategy. And your strategy may need to change, but you need to have clarity about what it is. Now, not detailed plans, because right now, who knows? I mean, you know, I wake up every day and the world is different than it was the day before. So how can you possibly have a detailed plan? But I think clarity about the strategic intent, you know, your reason for being, what are you here for? What's broadly speaking, you know, the, the, the value you add to the world. Then what I recommend is develop a set of scorecards, which take that broader strategy and translate it into something that's act actionable and measurable. Then you take your scorecards and you take all those portfolio items and you rank order them. So you say, okay, here's, you know, here's from starting from perfect, you know, all the way down to rats and mice. And then you do some disengagement. You say, these are the things we're simply going to stop doing. They're not, they're not, either they don't fit the strategy or they were a good idea at one point and they're no longer relevant or whatever. Then you go look for places where your capabilities might be relevant to a new opportunity, to something that's new that needs to get started uh, quickly. Um, and then you use discovery driven planning, which as I mentioned, is this process of sort of iterative, quick learning to quickly evaluate and develop those new opportunities. So it's kind of portfolio analysis, disengagement, search for new opportunities, and then plan for them in a sensible way. Um, I'm, I don't think there's any point making hugely detailed strategic plans right now. Now, the exception would be if you're in um, a situation where you've got to be planning for things like um, you know, oil and gas exploration or really you know, dangerous kind of capital intensive activities. Operationally, you need to plan those with a great deal of care. But strategically, I think you need to keep as much flexibility as you can right now. We have time for uh, one or two more questions, I think. So if you see any good questions at Slido, please remember to upload the best questions you see. So we managed to to ask them within the time we have uh, we have here. But the next question is from Aril. Many companies are having economic problems and may need to lower their costs. Will this speed up the digital revolution with fewer employee employees to lower costs? Well, I think um, well, the digital revolution is going to be sped up uh, for cost purposes, of course, but but for a lot of other reasons too. Uh, I mentioned Klockner, which is you know the fact that they've gone digital means there's so much more they can do, right? With so much uh, less. Um, so I think I think the, the crisis is really putting a lot of companies' digital efforts on hyperdrive. And I have a brand new article just out in the Harvard Business Review called Discovery Driven Digital Transformation. I encourage you to, to look it up. Uh, and it basically outlines how you want to be thinking about digital. And it's not one big bang, you know, we're going to pin our hopes on this one thing. It's much more kind of let's learn our way into what we need to be doing in the future. Um, and Klockner is a great example of this. You know, they started off digitally, just replacing fax machines, <laughs> you know, and uh, and that proved a success. And then the next thing was, well, uh, once we've got orders going digital, what if we did a digital version of the warehouse? And then, you know, and so they sort of learned their way into what's now a digital platform, not only for themselves, but for the industry. Great. We have uh, last questions. Uh, question here. Uh, how important is 
uh, is corporate culture and values. Will the current crisis change the existing short-termism and leaders promoting own interests? <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I've been talking about this for years now, which is that, you know, I think the way that we have allowed corporations to basically be, my friend Bill Lozano calls this legally looted, uh, for the benefit of a very few people, I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake in how we design social um, uh, reward structures. Um, and, you know, this is the, the line of thought. Pickety was, was an early version and there have been many more. So I certainly hope so. Now that's going to require a couple of things. It's going to require courage on the part of policymakers. It's going to require um, less money in politics. And in the U.S., um, we had a, in my opinion, rather catastrophic ruling that basically said unlimited money can go into politics. Well, if you've got, you know, capitalism was never designed so that not only did you have people competing within a, a framework, you had people manipulating the framework, <laughs> you know? And, and I mean, the, the role of government is supposed to be to create kind of a fair, even playing field and to set the rules under, under which capitalist competition takes place. So a great resource on this. And my friend, Rebecca Henderson, great book called Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. And if even five people from this webinar went out and bought that book, I think the world would be a better place. Great. Thank you very much, Rita.